Every season is spooky season in our book. So settle in and prepare to be shut up. You are listening to Shook, a comedic podcast about all things paranormal and unexplained. I'm Santa. Hey, friends. I'm Amanda. And fun fact, I literally had the best birthday ever. I am 35 and I feel alive. Uh, I had a really wonderful time on my birthday. Connolly was great. My family was great. My friends are great. I had a great weekend prior because guess what? I got to see Santa and you might want to jump off on that point. But I also really want to thank everybody listening, everybody who sent me a message on Instagram or Facebook. You guys are amazing. Thank you. And I hope everybody has a happy birthday for the rest of all time. Yes, um, definitely the fun fact, just the the overarching fun fact is that Amanda came up to Nashville a couple days before her birthday, and we just had a girls weekend. We, oh, one of the things that we did, we went to an escape room, shout out Nashville escape experience um, on Union Street or whatever, downtown. We did this escape room called the inheritance and it was really hard um because (laughs) we're not built for an escape room if we're going to do an escape room we need to be in there with some people who can like take charge and figure out the codes and all that (laughs) we just want to find the clues and unlock the stuff so if like somebody next time we do an escape room, somebody come with us and just do all the codes and then hand us the keys so that we can unlock the things. Cause that's really what we're there for. We're there for that dopamine hit, opening the lock and opening the drawer, opening the door, making it to the next room. Spoiler alert. We did not even make it to the next room. You know how escape rooms usually have multiple doors that you can go through and Mm -hmm. multiple rooms within the escape room. We didn't make it into the next room at all. (laughs) And it was one of those like trap door bookcase things, which would have been really fucking cool if we had figured that yeah, out. Yeah, but I feel like that's on me because I said, we can manage our time in this room because I'm thinking this is all we're going to get because I didn't realize that that was a trap door. I was like, we can take our time. We can dabble over here and over here. And then we're like, what? There's a second room. I genuinely actually thought that was all. And I was like, wow, this is really low budge for an escape room because I thought it really was just that tiny room. I've done many escape rooms before, so you would think I would have done better with this one, but um, all the ones I've done before were like very involved and had a lot of theatrics built in. And some of the ones I've done before had costumes you put on and props that you carry around. I did one one time where we had to put on like a bulletproof vest bulletproof vest it was oh my god not, but it was just part of the character but anyway that the escape room was really fun even though we failed um we did actually you know solve a lot of it to our credit it was just the two of us and every other time yeah. i've done an escape room there's been at least four people yes. so you can divide and conquer but in this particular setup we were just immediately inundated with clues. I felt like kazoo kid because I was like, where do we start? Because there's so many yeah. different <laughs> things. And I found out when the lady came in that I had discovered a clue that I wasn't supposed to discover until farther along. So I couldn't piece together what it was for because there was like a, well, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but who cares? The car. Who cares? So there's like a car and it's a <laughs> magnet and you're supposed to put it on the wall to unlock something underneath a picture frame. But I wasn't there yet and I thought it was supposed to go over the map that's on the wall because why not? It's a car and a map. Anyways, but to our credit, when we asked the lady how we did for d- just being two of us, she said, you did about average. She was just being <laughs> sweet because she saw how hard we were trying Because, you know, they have that control room where they can just, like, watch you the whole time. I would love to work in an escape room. Side note. That'd be so much fun. Because I would just be in everybody's business, even if they didn't ask for a hint. Be, like, voice of God from the speaker box in the corner. Like, hey, you should probably check underneath that plant pot. One time, one of the escape rooms that we did with my mom and Richard and my niece, my niece got scared at one point during it. And because there was like a zombie thing that popped out and it startled her. And she was like, no. uh And my mom had to like take her out. And then they 
went into the control room. So Callie got to see all of that. And then she wasn't scared anymore. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Callie. <laughs> oh, Santa. Also, y'all, Santa got me the cutest shirt for my birthday. I love it. It's a little alien. Little baby alien. Ooh, yeah. And I love this color because spring is starting to feel mm -hmm. like spring has sprung. I know it's still only February. However, I was running my pup today and it was about almost 70 degrees and a bitch was sweating. I was sweating. I was like, okay. It's, okay, it's, this it was hot today. A teaser. Yeah. I've been out here wearing a sweatshirt and for what? It's hot. For what? Because when we were together the whole weekend, it was raining and people did not know how to drive, but do they ever in Nashville? And it was yeah, chaotic. They don't. Thank you for driving, hunty. I was like, <laughs> like and there were potholes everywhere that you didn't know about. So I had to be the one to do it because I already know where the potholes are. So I know when to swerve ahead of time and stuff. Yeah, but we had a good time. We relaxed. We did. And you had a rare weekend off, so I'm glad we got to spend it together. Yeah, I never have a weekend off, and I'm not going to have another weekend off until the Oregon Ghost Conference. Ever heard of it? Ever heard of it? Yeah. See you there or not, but hopefully see you there. Be there or be square. Yeah. Be there or don't, but preferably do. <laughs> but Please. also, I understand if you can't travel that far but if you live near there come on hell yeah um who goes first this week I believe I do so I guess this is the time that we must tell you our stories that had us shook mm -hmm. and I'm excited about mine because you're not gonna you're not gonna know what hit you oh, but what story had you shook this week well, Santa, I'm happy to tell you about it. The story that had me shook this week was inspired by the fact that we are going to Oregon Ghost Conference. I really felt like I owed it to our listeners out in Oregon. I got to cover a haunted location in Oregon, so I'm going to do one. And uh, that story is the story of the ever so haunted Hasita Head Lighthouse off of the oh, Oregon Oh, I Coast. love a lighthouse. Oh, Yeah. I'm just going to dive right in. Hopefully this doesn't take too long. I think it should be pretty succinct, but we will we will see. So built in 1894, Hesita Head Lighthouse, sometimes referred to simply as Hesita Head Light, is sitting pretty on a 3.5 acre lot at 56 feet tall. And it's located, get this Santa, 13 miles between Florence, Oregon and Yahats, Oregon. Our lucky number, so I loved that off the bat. Um, she's beauty, she's grace, and she emits the strongest beam <laughs> of all other lighthouses nearby. I want to say there's 11 lighthouses that are still on the coast of Oregon, but she's got the strongest beam. She's like, I'm out here. She's um, the main character. She is the main character. Basically, so her beam can be seen 21 nautical miles away, which in terms of land miles, that's about 24 land miles and if you if you're a kilometers gal or guy uh 39 kilometers uh so she goes pretty far out there um named after a spanish explorer from the 1770s bruno de Hesita y dudaguita the Hesita head lighthouse was established in 1894 and later was listed on the national register of historic places in november of 1978 so from the time it was established to getting put on that register, that's like almost 200 years. Pretty cool. Bruno de Hesita mapped and made several discoveries around the Oregon coast in 1776. And in doing so, he and several of his sailors, they got real seriously sick with scurvy. Um, and scurvy is what you get when you don't get your vitamin C. It's a real awful, awful illness, and it can be deadly. I'm not sure how many of his folks died, but it did cause them to have to abort their mission, which was to expand into Oregon's territory and just explore. They pretty much had to limit that to that part of the coast that they were on. Um, they had to head back um, to Mexico. Um because it just wasn't working out, everybody was sick. Now maintained by Oregon State Parks and Recreation Department as a state park, the lighthouse keeper's house on the property now serves as a bed and breakfast. And in between the establishment of it and everything in between, basically this little cliff 
It had everything, Hunty. It had everything. Mm -hmm. So during World War II, it served as the barracks for U.S. military, and it was also a satellite campus for Lane Community College out of Eugene, Oregon from 1970 until 1995. And of course, as you probably expected, she's haunted. She's she's a little bit haunted. So she's got it all. It's kind of giving, um, I'm not like other lighthouses. Ooh. There's so many lighthouse, like haunted lighthouse stories. There's lots <laughs> of haunted ones. But betwixt her strong beam and the nature of the haunting we're going to get into, she's unique. She's definitely unique. And hopefully you and I can go there one day. Not on our Oregon yeah. Ghost Conference trip because it's, I think, upwards towards Washington. So it's a little far out there. But one day I want to go. So the ghost who roams the property, she is known as Rue, a.k.a. the Grey Lady. Rue the ghost was allegedly, well, first and foremost, there was a couple of different theories. The internet has kind of cobbled together what they think the main theory is. Some people say it's the ghost of a child, but that doesn't really track. The theory that I'm sticking with that I personally believe is that Rue is the apparition, the spirit of a woman. Rue the ghost was allegedly the wife of one of the lighthouse keepers who had a daughter who sadly passed away by drowning. Um, some say that Rue's daughter drowned in the ocean, which that would have been awful because it's a steep drop off the cliff. Other people say that she died drowning in the cistern on the property. And in case you don't know, a cistern is basically a well, but it is fully waterproofed on the inside. And that's just where people would store rainwater, basically is what that is. Um, in any case, obviously super tragic. No matter if it was a cistern or the ocean, obviously the loss of her daughter, who is believed to be buried on the property, and the evidence to corroborate that is there is an unmarked grave on the property that's kind of been grown over a little bit. No name, no nothing, but it's clearly a grave, and they think that that is the grave of Rue's daughter who passed. So obviously this destroyed Rue, unable to cope. Um, the legend is that Rue, the gray lady, comes back to this day to the lighthouse to look for her daughter as if she can undo what has been done. Like she she wants her daughter, she wants her baby, and she's coming back for her. And as I go through the evidence of what people have seen and heard, it definitely does seem like it's a woman and not anything else. It's not a malicious spirit. She's kind of like a trickster at times, you'll see. Um but nowhere in my research did I see anything about people seeing a childlike ghost. Um, so I'm just going completely on track with the Rue the Lady theory. Um, but Santa, do you want to guess how we know that this ghost's name is Rue? Is it because someone was tampering in the lighthouse and she said, You will rue the day that you darkened my doorstep? Is that why? <laughs> That's exactly why. <laughs> you will rue the day. Oh, rue is it? <laughs> we will call her rue. No, so remember how I told you that the lighthouse used to be a satellite campus for that community college out of Eugene, Oregon? Yeah. There were some students from that school who decided that they were going to come up and try to figure out what's going on. What's all the ruckus on this cliff? And they pulled out their Ouija board. And they asked the spirit what is your name and it's simply like no bullshit no games it went straight to r-u-e hmm. rue so basically it's a scientific fact it's giving nola allman like that time it i did the ouija is. board yes okay was that episode two that you mentioned that yes i believe it was it was in the early days it was like two maybe three i think it Were was episode gage two. who were you with i forget yeah I yeah. was, uh, yeah, Gage was there and his girlfriend at the time and I think her roommates and we mm. were, they were carving pumpkins and I just brought the Ouija board cause I'm a freak of nature. And I was like, I don't want to carve pumpkins, but I do want to call in some spirits. Yeah. And they said, okay, they didn't care, but they didn't participate. So yeah, yeah but I got a name. And it was Nola Ullman. And we still don't know if that's actually a person, right? Yeah, because that night I I Googled. Yeah, I've Googled the name since, too, and nothing comes up. 
So it's possible that I also might have gotten some wrong letters. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Like maybe like some letters got mixed up. Hopefully it wasn't a demon. That's all I'm going to say. It seems like it was, but. Yeah. So like I said, scientific fact. Uh, Just kidding. Many folks who have visited the landmark over the years, they have reported evidence of Rue's return to the property, including the following. And I'm just going to rattle off a few of the things. The sound of a woman crying or coughing. The sight of several orbs floating around the house. An alleged white mist that has appeared out of thin air. A startling high-pitched scream. Rustling in the attic. Moved or misplaced objects that will return later on. And lastly, the actual sight of a gray, wispy apparition. And so many more. So I could go on and on. But those are the primary ones that were often corroborated in my research. Um, So once in the 1970s, a former lighthouse keeper named Jim Anderson was fixing a window up in the attic which, by the way, you can't go up there anymore because the stairs are not up to code. Um, it's a little mm-hmm. rickety. You can't go up there at all. He was fixing up the window in the attic when suddenly he saw the shadow of a gray-haired woman clad in her Victorian period clothing. Obviously, thinking that he was alone, the sight of this woman freaked him the heck out. And you best believe he dropped that window and he shattered it all over the floor. Well, later on, the caretaker that was on the floor below the attic had heard what he described as a sweeping noise like somebody's out here cleaning up their mess well here's the kicker jim had not said anything to anyone about the broken window he was just going to clean it up later and nobody else had been up there and believe it or not the next thing they know they go up there and the glass is found just sitting in a neat pile it's just sitting in a little pile who did that i want to know who did it like I said, did she nobody clean it knew. Up? Yeah, like she's a helpful ghost, which we love to see. Um, I'd like her to come to my house, actually. Um, there's some projects I could put her to. Honestly, like I'll give her a Dyson and say, come on. But yeah, so no one knew about this broken window. Jim had mentioned this to literally no one. Um, and side note, Santa, I have an idea. I think we should start a new business on the side, just a little side hustle, and we'll rent out period piece items. And we'll call it Victorian Secret or (laughs) Victorian Confidential. (laughs) What's Victorian Confidential? Like Victoria's Secret, but it's period clothing. It's like bras and underoos that you would wear in the 1800s. (laughs) Victorian Confidential. I mean, honestly, that would be pretty epic. Because all you have to do is buy one of everything in every size, and then you just rent them out to people, and nobody has to know. It can be offered in discreet packaging. <laughs> no one needs to know that you like to cosplay as Sarah Winchester yeah. or somebody else. <laughs> or That's Rue. definitely actually something I'm trying to do. So, I'm, yeah, who has a business like this where I can rent a Sarah Winchester costume? Because, I mean, I would love to cosplay as Sarah Winchester at some point because honestly y'all know be epic. I'm obsessed with her well if you're gonna do that I'm gonna dress up as the skunk ape so oh, watch out okay but don't worry I'll wear, per- <laughs> I'll wear I'll wear perfume I'm not gonna come out here stinking like an actual skunk ape um, oh, well, good. anyways good good um <laughs> okay so where did I leave off here On to some more secondhand accounts of the haunting. There are guests at the lighthouse's bed and breakfast, which has now been converted into, obviously, um, that also report personal items going missing. Almost always the item is returned or at least found somewhere where it wasn't left to begin with. I actually discovered a brand new, well, brand new to me YouTube channel that I've got to shout out big time. This family from the YouTube channel, Ghost Hard, they stayed at the most haunted room in the B&B. I want to say it's called the Victoria Room or Victorian Room, something like that. Um, And they had a couple of paranormal experiences, but they didn't really, they were semi-skeptical about it. Like they said, eh, it could have been, could have been the ghost, could have been nothing. But what had happened was the father of the group got up in the middle of the night to use the restroom and he had a backpack that was kind of on the on the doorway like it was blocking his entry into the bathroom so he scooted it over just a little bit 
But when he came out of the bathroom, he, like, was laying down, and I don't know if he had gone back to sleep or he woke up, but the next thing he knew, he looked over. The backpack wasn't sitting where it was. It had been slid farther down the wall towards, like, the apex, like, where the corner was. And he's like, I didn't do that. Neither his wife nor his daughter knew how it how it got there. And then the mother of the group said that she felt, when she was in the bed asleep, she felt what felt like two hands like hunched over her ankles, like putting pressure on the bed. The only explanation for that could have been her daughter, but her daughter was passed out next to her. Like she didn't, she's not a tosser. She's not a turner. It wasn't her. So she felt like a pressure at the foot of the bed. They didn't really get too upset about that. They're like, eh, maybe it was the ghost, maybe not. Um, But what's cool is I don't think they even noticed this when it happened, but when they entered the property for the first time, it was pitch black outside and they had their bright lights on filming some B-roll for the video and they had it on the outside of the house. And if you look at the attic window, you see what looks like an apparition, a gray apparition just roll past the window from the inside and it just fades away. And they caught it in post because they're like, did you see it? And then they mentioned it briefly, I think, at the end of the video when they had their little um, recap of the experience. But when I saw that, I said, whoa, like, I don't know if they somehow sneakily edited that in in post, but it was pretty convincing. I, it was the first time I've seen anything like that on just a, a YouTube channel in a while. So that was pretty cool. It's called Ghost Hard. <laughs> Ghost Hard. And I have to say, Hunty, they are so freaking funny. Like, they make <laughs> they make light of things. Not necessarily, like, I don't think it's disrespectful. I think they're just having fun with it. But anyways, <laughs> I love them, and I'm, I subscribed. So in another couple's encounter, they were just chilling in the parlor when the woman saw a gray figure floating across the hall at the base of the stairs. The witness said that she moved with purpose. She wasn't just like dilly-dallying. She knew where she was going, but she just disappeared. There was also a woman named Carolina who slept at the B&B, and she stated that she felt a presence get into bed with her. I want to say it was around 3 or 4 a.m., and the presence stayed with her for hours. Hours. And she said that... She didn't feel threatened by the spirit. She was just kind of like, okay, I guess we're having a sleepover. Um, (laughs) She said that she didn't feel threatened or anything, but she said, and I quote, she felt concerned but unharmed. Workers at the bed and breakfast have also said that after making the bed, you can see an impression of where someone may have been sitting or resting. That's pretty cool. Um, kind of similar to how that woman felt the pressure on the foot of the bed. Some guests have also reported hearing footsteps overhead in the attic, along with the sound of furniture being moved. So I don't know what she's rearranging up in that attic, but all people hear is just shuffling, like, like back and forth. Um, and I have to say, Santa... Here's why we don't know for a fact that Rue is actually the resident ghost, if that's actually her name, because the Lighthouse Keeper records that they always would have, they only included the actual man of the house, the Lighthouse Keeper. There were no records of the wives or the children, just the men. Not sure if that's sexist or just laziness. I don't know. Um, well, if it's the lighthouse keeper, though, wait, did the f- whole family live there? Sometimes. In the mm-hmm. Yeah. So they only kept record of the man who was managing the property, which, by the way, I found out being a lighthouse keeper is a really, really, really hard job because most of the time, like, I don't feel like a lot of people can just bring their family with them. It's very isolated. Um, I think I heard and one of the podcasts I was listening to about this, the closest restaurant to the spend breakfast is like 20 minutes away. So, and back then they probably didn't even have all of that. So not only are you isolated in a, in a lighthouse, but you also have to fend for yourself and know how to garden and maybe milk a cow and do enough to sustain yourself while you're out there. Cause you're there for long stints of time. If you want to have a potentially paranormal experience yourself, go for it. Um, I do want to say, though, that they do offer tours as well as being able to stay there, but 
You can't go up the stairs. Like I said, it's not up to code. You could literally die. Don't try it. Don't do it. Um, and you're going to have to probably book your trip out months in advance. And I heard sometimes rooms go up for like 600 a night. So it's an expensive little vacation if you want to go, but it's very charming. I saw lots of video footage of this place and I really want to go. It's even got like a white picket fence around it. It's just, oh, it's goals. But yeah, $600 per night, super remote area, uh, got a book way in advance, and they don't market it as a haunted location. When you get there, though, they'll say, you might encounter some stuff if you come here. And they have a log book in the hotel. It's like a guest book. So when you come into the B&B, you open a book and it has pages upon pages upon pages of people who have had different things happen to them. And if you go, you can leave your thing. Um, I did see that it is rated 4.8 stars online on the Google machine. But whether the haunting is real or not, you know, folks flock there all the time um, and have a great time there. So I want to go. And yeah. I had lots of cool sources for this story, but in particular, I wanted to shout out that YouTube channel, Ghost Hard. Uh, their video is called Sleeping with Ghosts at the Haunted Hasita Head Lighthouse. And then I also wanted to shout out the podcast Hillbilly Horror Stories. They did a really, really entertaining deep dive on this location, and I could have probably included several other accounts of what had happened, but over time, it started to get a little bit redundant. People were reporting the same things, so... That is the Hasita Head Lighthouse. I hope you liked mm. it. Oh my gosh. So the lighthouse is a B&B now? Yep. It uh Okay. Once it once they decided that Oh, I didn't mention this. Once they decided that uh, a computer can do it. We can automate it. They no longer had a need for a lighthouse keeper. And so they said, "Eh, we'll just convert it to a B&B." They still have it open for tours, but it's been everything. It's literally, it's literally Coastal Oregon's hottest club. It was barracks for military. It was the stomping grounds of some Spanish, you know, explorers. It was a satellite campus for students. It was the place where allegedly someone lost their child and has to return. Like it, it's been so many things. I couldn't figure out what I wanted to cover this week. I was just like, I got to do something in Oregon. And there was one thing in Portland that I almost covered, but I'm going to save it for later. But I saw this lighthouse and yeah. I said, she's cute. I'm going to talk about it. And yeah. But anyways, enough about that. What story had you shook this week, Santa? Well, so remember um a couple episodes ago when i covered the north sea yeah. and you covered the oakville blob incident mm -hmm. well you know the oakville blob incident of 1994 but have you ever heard of the kentucky meat shower excuse me <laughs> <laughs> i'm so confused is this a thing? Yes. The Kentucky meat shower is a thing. And I'll tell you about it. This phenomenon occurred on the morning of March 3rd, 1876, near the town of Olympia Springs in Bath County, Kentucky. For a period of several minutes between 11 a.m. and 12 p.m., chunks of red meat fell from the sky onto an area about the size of a football field. There was only one eyewitness to the flesh actively raining down. And her name is Mrs. Crouch. Mrs. Crouch, a farmer's wife, happened to be outside making soap when she noticed the meat falling around her. She, of course, reported this, and the news of the phenomenon spread to the New York Times, and then the New York Herald sent a correspondent to follow up on the story. Members of the Olympia Springs community could not stress enough that they believed Mrs. Crouch's claims of what she saw because she was perceived by them as too good to be guilty, or in other words, is not the type to orchestrate a hoax for attention or anything of that nature. Mrs. Crouch reported that the weather was clear and sunny on the day of the incident, so it wasn't rain happening mm -hmm. <laughs> at all when the flesh rained down. She was the only one home that day except for her grandson, who at first thought it was snowing when the meat began to fall. Mm -mm. He was like, is that snow? 
Was it like partially was... frozen or something? No, I feel like he was really little and uneducated. Oh, okay, yeah. And he just saw something falling from the sky all around and he was like whoa i'm gonna make a meat angel it wasn't until a large piece hit the ground behind her and made a snapping like noise when it struck that mrs crouch grabbed her grandson and retreated indoors because that was feeling a little apocalyptic and gross for her yeah that's gross my grandbaby cannot bear witness to this it's dark-sided um it seems a little dark-sided Mrs. Crouch told the Herald that in her state of shock and fear, she thought that perhaps my husband and son who were away had been torn to pieces and their remains were being brought home to me in this way. Oh, like God. her mind immediately went to, is this the flesh of my murdered husband and son? The paranoia. Yikes. I wouldn't immediately probably think that. I, would just I honestly don't know what I would think if I saw that, though. I don't know what I would think either. I mean, I know she was terrified, but yeah. they also live on a farm where there's, like, livestock, I assume. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I just thought it was interesting that her first thought of explanation was, they've been murdered. They've been murdered, and the murderers have dropped their blood and guts here to taunt me. This is it. This is how it ends. They're out to get me, and this is how they're doing it. But she also considered that it could have been a message from God, something like a an omen or something, you know, mm-hmm. how, like, foreshadowing omens can occur, signs can be given to you. She was quoted as saying, coming events are said to cast their shadows beforehand. Mm. And so that was like her way of saying foreshadowing. Yeah. Olympian Springs proprietor Harrison Gill paid a visit to the Crouch Farm to see what all the fuss was about. He saw pieces of meat stuck to fences and scattered all over the ground. He and Mrs. Crouch's husband, Alan, collected some samples and put them in bottles with alcohol. The Herald correspondent tried to convince a local Irish rail worker named Jimmy Welch, to taste one of the collected samples, offering him $1 to do so. No! Yeah, that's so trifling. Uh Uh-uh, it's tainted. Yeah, that's like some shit that people do in middle school. Uh, Actually, don't do anything that someone dares you to do for any amount of money because Mr. Ballin covered some story about a kid who was dared to eat a snail, and he did it, and then he died because he got a parasite from the snail. Oh my god! Left him completely like in a vegetative state, and then he died. Yeah, so don't do it. Also, if anyone is offering you money to do something crazy or daring you to do something that they aren't willing to do themselves, that is an act of exploitation. So don't take the bait. And also, a dollar. <laughs> I don't think that'll even get you a pack of gum anymore. That doesn't get you anything. You can't even get something at the Dollar Tree for a dollar. No. And yes, a dollar in 1876 was definitely worth more. Like, Mm. it was a lot. True. Back then, they were, like, selling acres of land for, like, $5 a piece. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, it was was a good amount of money, but guess what? Jimmy Welch was like, I really don't want to do this, but I guess I'll give it a try. And he, he was getting ready to do it, but he was so grossed out. And... He, then he was like, actually, I just remembered that I gave up meat for Lent. So actually, I can't. I can't. My hands are tied. Wait, are you joking? Or did Sorry. he actually say that? Yeah. Oh, my God. Lent was yesterday. That's so funny. <laughs> oh, really? Synchronicity. Yeah. Congratulations to everyone who made it through Lent, whatever you gave up. Um, I feel like it's always Lent for me. Every day is Lent. I'm always depriving myself of stuff that I want for health reasons. And every day feels like Lent. Every day. But you know what? I'm not giving up all the way. Meat. After hearing about this Kentucky meat shower, I am a little bit like not wanting to eat meat. Fortunately, I have a lot of Beyond chicken nuggets Uh in the freezer. So I don't have to eat meat for some time. 
But anyway, so Jimmy Welch invoked his remembering that he gave up meat for Lent to get out of having to eat that. But that's okay because they were able to get a butcher named Frisbee to try it. He didn't have any hesitation about it because he's all about the meat, you know? Mm -hmm. Meat is his middle name. Frisbee Meat Jackson. I don't know if Jackson was his last name, actually. We just know that his name was Frisbee. Oh, my God. Um, and his middle name is Meat. So he wasn't scared at all. He he actually was bragging about how, like, tough he is and how he can handle just about anything prior to putting that in his mouth. So he tried it, and he chewed it a few times, and then he spit it out. He said, I have handled all kinds of meat, and I never tasted anything like this before. I am not prepared to say for certain that the taste resembled that of either fish, flesh, or fowl. It looked more like mutton than anything else I can compare it to. So it definitely wasn't anything good, but he definitely could identify that it was meat. Because so far, they've just been assuming it was meat, but hadn't yeah. done anything scientific to determine that yet. Yeah. Another local named Joe Jordan took a bite of a sample and quickly spit it out. He said... I did not keep it in my mouth long enough to perceive any taste. It was about a week after it had fallen before I even saw it. Trigger warning, I squeezed some of the pieces I had and a brown mucus came from it. Oh my god. Blech. Oh my god, that's so gross. Some of the meat was very dry, like dried beef. It was elastic and... The smell was offensive in the extreme, like that of a dead body. But, like, to be fair, they're out here passing around weak old meat. <laughs> like, what do you expect it to taste like or look like or smell like? You know what I mean? <laughs> weak old meat, man. Old meat that's been sitting out smells pretty fucking bad. Ugh. And tastes bad, I'm sure. Anyway, that was back in the day when people were dumb. That's probably why people people's lifespans were so short back in the day because they were just like out here eating anything. Oh my god, that that had been sitting out. Yeah, and I mean these things were like put into specimen jars essentially with alcohol, but like still, it's meat. You need to like dry age it in order for it to be you know something that you can just eat. Like don't. Mm -hmm. also, I don't know. What were they thinking? Yeah. Anyway, in July of the same year, Scientific American published an article in which a Brooklyn scientist named Leopold Brandeis had researched one of the collected samples that was given to him. Brandeis believes the meat was actually Nostoc, a colony bacteria that can swell up after a rain to appear as a jelly-like mass. Some call it star jelly or witch's butter, which that made me think of your Oakville blob story. Did anybody uh, yeah. have a theory about Nostoc for that? I don't remember reading the word Nostoc, but in how you referenced it being a bacteria, they did talk about it potentially being bacteria. But this wasn't clear. This meat wasn't clear. It looked like actual meat, right? Did they have pictures? Just do pictures. I don't have pictures because it was 1876. And honestly, I don't want to see any pictures of this because I know it looks yeah. nasty. Yeah, I just I honestly it. can't believe you're even covering this. <laughs> I am grossed out. And normally I would not want to cover something like this, but I really thought that it tied in with your Oakville blob story. It's perfect. But it was like, it was a different take on something mm -hmm. falling from the sky. I also was very shook by seeing that that was something that happened. And right. of course, this story I found in my ghost book, The Unidentified by, you already know, Colin Dickey. Hell yeah. So I found that today and I was like, well, I'm doing this because I'm actually shook reading this. So never heard of a Kentucky meat shower <laughs> until now. So anyways, some call it star jelly or witch's butter. This theory does not hold up, though, because the weather was clear and sunny at the time of the incident, and it had not rained, so Nostoc is not currently considered as a possible identifier of the substance. 
Soon after the Scientific American article was published, a member of the Newark Scientific Association named A. Mead Edwards wrote a letter to the editor to the publication in response to the article about the Kentucky meat shower. Edwards said that after a colleague, Dr. Alan McLean Hamilton, studied a sample of the meat substance under a microscope, he determined that it was lung tissue of <gasps> either a horse or a human infant based on the structural similarities. Edwards studied the meat himself and agrees with Dr. Hamilton. Edwards studied some other samples and identified those as being cartilage, muscular fibers, and connective tissue. So it, it has been scientifically identified as for sure being flesh of some sort. Now to consider the mystery of where the meat came from and why it rained down from above. The common theory for this is that a group of vultures vomited a recent meal in the area from above, thus causing the meat to fall from the sky. If that were true, there must have been a lot of vultures in order to produce that much meat rain. And that's my story. Santa, oh my God. (laughs) When you said lung tissue of a horse or an infant human... I was like, what in the fresh heck? Like, what? I know. So it's still technically unexplained because they they didn't ever actually prove, though, that it was just a a vulture party. It's very much unexplained. Like, we know that it's meat, and and that's all that we do know. We don't know why it fell from the sky. Vultures has been just what it's attributed to, um, but no one has said for sure. That's just, like, the, the leading theory because it's the only thing that would actually make scientific or real sense is that if it came from a bird like that. Jeez. Wait, uh, what was the surface area? Did it say the surface surface area that it covered? um, It was a hundred by 50 yards, a hundred yards by 50 yards. Where my mind went when you mentioned that this was a farmer, I thought, Maybe something with a wood chipper accident. I don't know if that would even physically spray anything that far. Yeah. And yeah. I don't, I don't know. It's all very disturbing. Every single it's possibility. Just that she saw it coming from the sky though. So it's less like, of like a projectile and more of yeah. just like an actual falling from the sky. Okay. According so she to saw Mrs. It Crouch. From above, not just. Splat, mm-hmm. splat, splat on the ground. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, honestly, the vulture theory, that kind of makes sense. I mean, I can't think of the likelihood of there being like a bunch of vultures throwing up at the same time. That's weirdly synchronized, you know? Yeah. Like who, that whoever is, is just throwing up at the same time. <laughs> like, you I, know. I, right. I threw up. Unless... I threw up too. <laughs> Unless they all just, like, ate something bad and it all, like, made them sick. But here's the thing, Santa. I don't know. I don't know what vultures can't eat because they are literal scavengers. They eat bacterial things all the time. Yeah, they eat dead bodies that have been sitting out. Yeah, for longer than a week. Longer than week old meat. (laughs) I don't, it's like. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, man. Yeah, I don't know what it could be, but I would love for those listening, if you have any theories on what you think it could be, because, I mean, maybe there are some other scientific possibilities that I'm not thinking of. Um, One thing I thought of that's just really, like, ridiculous is it could be aliens. No one has even mentioned aliens being part of this, but, like, what if it was aliens? The the time period makes this all the more interesting. If it were aliens, though, they could have just been like, oh, man, this human salad we were trying to make in our aircraft didn't turn out so good. Let's toss it out. I mean, that's literally all I can think of. Vultures or aliens, yeah. one or the other. Wow. I don't know. I, I hope one day that we can solve this caper because I would, I would love to know once and for all. Oh, yeah. Good find, Santa. Like, I've never run. I can't believe I didn't run across this when I was doing the Oakville blobs. That's crazy. Like, I'm surprised that you didn't. 
so gross. Yeah. Like, ew. Yeah. Because they're in the book, they talk about other like stuff falling from the sky incidents that have happened, but they didn't mention the Oakville blob incident, but they mentioned like a bunch of incidents in other countries where like just random things fell from the sky. I'm going to have to look into that. You said it's your unexplained Colin Dickey book. The unidentified. Oh, the unidentified. Yes. The unidentified. So Colin Dickey wrote my other favorite ghost book called Ghostland, which Ghostland talks about so many different hauntings and most of them are just very iconic ones in American history. Mm -hmm. And the unidentified is more about cryptids, aliens, and general unexplained events. And in both of those books, Colin Dickey does a really great job of telling the truth Mm -hmm. behind the things. So like if something can be debunked or if something if there if there are facts that contradict, you know, claims that have mm-hmm. been made, he's putting that in there. And I really appreciate that because, yeah, he's not going to lead you astray. He's here to give you the facts. He's a man about the facts. Show me the car facts. Oh, 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 Riley. Meat parts. Ew. Or my niece says, oh, 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 Riley's auto farts. Yeah, she's something else. Wait, did did she win at bowling? Most likely, but I, I'm not sure. Well, one thing about me, I won at bowling on my birthday, two out of three games. Congratulations. Thank you. I've been selected to win a free iPod Nano. <laughs> oh, ah! wow. Not really. Oh, Hunty, guess what? You have a new Patreon member to shout out this week. Oh my gosh, we do have a new Patreon member. Mm-hmm. And guess who it is? My mom, Denise. Thank you, mom, for becoming a patron. And I hope you enjoy the extra exclusive content. And... Everyone stay tuned for more of the exclusive content. I swear to God. Before I forget, Katia, total queen. Thank you, Katia, for my very thoughtful gift. If you don't mind, I'm going to make that a Patreon exclusive, the unboxing video. I already sent it to you. Yeah, you should. But honestly, that was the most thoughtful freaking package. Oh, my gosh. I about about cried. It was great. And then if you're okay with it, I'll put this unboxing yeah. on there i looked a little yeah, bit haggard because i just gotten back from whooping ass at bowling and i was sweaty honestly you looked cute in the video so oh, thanks queen um i guess to wrap it up uh just a reminder we have merch available we have hats shirts hoodies sweatshirts coffee mug uh bot- water bottle thing uh probably more to come i think i'm at my limit for the number of listings but i'm probably gonna take like the bottom performers off like if if we don't get a lot of sales on a certain item i'll probably remove it in lieu of another item that i might want Mm -hmm. on there that might look cute um so please if you if you want to support us please consider getting some merch or joining the patreon page we're growing and i really appreciate that and i know santa does too like we're out here we're hustling and bustling and finally, Oregon Ghost Conference in March. We really hope that if you live out that way, you can come. And hopefully you enjoyed the stories that we had for you today. Anyways, thank you so much for listening to this episode. I hope that you made it through my disgusting story about the Kentucky meat shower. I know that was really hardcore, but I won't be doing anything that gross going forward for a while. So it, it'll be a safe space henceforth. Rest um, assured. Anyways, yeah. Thank you. And see you next time with yeah. a really cool story that I'm really excited about already. Yeah. yeah. Stay shook. Thank you so much for tuning into Shook. New episodes of Shook drop every other Wednesday on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you love to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on today's episode, please check out our show notes. And until next time, stay shook. Do you have a personal paranormal encounter you'd like to share with us? 
If so, visit our website, shookpodcast.com, and fill out our contact form. Or send us an email at shookparanormalpod at gmail.com. And one last thing, friends. Shook is a 100% independently produced podcast. So please consider supporting our show by either leaving a review or contributing to our Patreon page. You can find that at patreon.com slash shookpodcast.